I'm happy to have Chris here. Chris um, cannot play the piano that well. That's why he started <laughs> to code his music. And that's what he's going to uh, talk about today. Thank you, Chris. Enjoy. Thanks very much. That is literally true, even though it sounds like just a joke. So I have been programming music for quite a while now, quite a few years. And I do a lot of it at conferences like this where we have a, a bunch of programmers present. And one of the uh, things I've noticed over the years is that when I show people how to create musical structures using code, there's quite a few common questions that people ask. And uh, I've summed up quite a few of them in a, in a unified concept of this talk. So this is about verifying musical correctness because the major preoccupation a lot of people have when they see my music as code is, well, how do you make sure that you don't play a wrong note? And this is an extended answer to why that's actually a very difficult question. So first of all, people will often ask, can I try it myself? Which I guess is something that as a programming industry we've got fairly well solved. Right? We've got package managers, they can get a project from GitHub, they can put stuff in their editor, they can make things work. It's a little bit of a problem for non-programmers because when you have to start explaining to people how to set up Vim or Emacs to get a sound, that definitely dampens the mood. But I guess if people have learned to take a violin and get to the point where they can make a good sound, they can probably also uh, do that with Emacs. Um, the, the other thing that uh, I get asked is, can it be used to generate music? Because the big way that I would normally do it is a way of representing existing music as an alternative notation. But one of the things that people really want to do, especially in the era of you know, using deep neural networks to simulate music, is they want to work out whether you can actually use it to have a, a hands-free, automated musical experience. I think that's a little bit symptomatic of attitudes in our community where we want to jump straight from just understanding how to program something through to let's automate it completely hands off, right? Whereas actually most of the time there's this really rich place in the middle where we have human assisted uh, composition in this case. Uh, you, know, you could see that, that particular case in chess programs. Right? There's a long time at which a human plus a computer was a superior player to either a human or a computer. But the big one that comes up, and this very much depends on the social context of the conference, is can you use types to enforce these rules once you see how a key works and how a canon works? And in particular, that happens in, as you might expect, conferences where people who are, uh, make really good use of static types. So, so uh, I got a lot of questions about that. I, uh, uh, Michael mentioned earlier on Farm, the workshop that's attached to ICFP, which is about art and culture and music. Um, I got a lot of questions about using types to enforce musical correctness after that. And the reason why I think it's a really interesting subject is there are kind, to me, two layers of the kind of invariance you might want to enforce with types or any kind of musical technology. One is the kind of the inevitable constraint of reality. You can play an A or a B on a harmonica, you can't play an apple or a chair on a harmonica. It's just, it's an impossibility and what types do is protect you from impossibility, so protect you from contradiction. But what people want to do when they're talking about preventing you from playing a wrong note is not so much preventing something that's impossible in the domain to something that is undesirable in the domain. And the reason why that's kind of dangerous is you have this, you have, a, say, tautologies at one level of your kind of spectrum of correctness that are always fine. You have contradictions that are always just unfine and you can reject them. But you have a whole bunch of gray area in the middle of statements that might be true or false that can depend on context. So. If I'm going to talk about what musical correctness is, I need to model for you what might correct or incorrect mean in music. And the, the basis I'm going to do for that is a book called Sweet Anticipation by David Huron, which I, I really recommend. So it's not a programming book, but it does contain some information theory. So uh, he builds up this theory of what music is from a psychological perspective. And I've really reductively boiled down his thesis into three claims. So first of all, he claims that music is appreciated as a statistical process of statistical learning. So you learn to expect what note is likely to happen next in all sorts of complicated ways. So you might learn it because the piece is in a particular key, a key of G, and that makes it really likely that the next note will be in the key of G, or that it will end on a perfect cadence if you're in a classical music tradition, or that uh, the backbeat is where the next hit will come if you're listening to rock and roll music. So there's a statistical model that you are building up as a listener 
based on your experience of that piece of music, but also your genre, also your lifetime of musical acculturation. And of course, that does depend on what tradition you come from, and if you listen to a different kind of music, you have different expectations. Um, the second claim he makes is that correct prediction delights your thinking fast brain. So there's a sense of pleasure, there's a fundamental mechanism in the way you listen to music, which is you're expecting something, and then it happens. <coughs> So that, uh, that kind of uh, explains a whole lot of musical structures where there's rhythms or beats or expectation built up or you might experience it as tension and then you get release when your prediction is fulfilled. So that's kind of one lever, but if that was the only force, then the best way to compose music would be just to have like drone music, right? Just the same note forever, you would make a perfect <laughs> prediction and there'd be, you'd know exactly what was going on, right? But you don't, you don't experience, well, depends on what kind of avant-garde music you're into, but you probably don't experience just like, like drone music as exhilarating. So why not? Because you need that tension before the release. So novelty keeps your thinking slow brain interested. So you experience this kind of upper and lower bound of you want to come back to prediction being successful, but you also want to introduce enough complexity that you have that moment of confusion before that moment of clarity. I should also say he's not prescriptive about this. He doesn't say good music is one that resolves more cleanly but he uh, makes the claim that these forces are fundamental to how we experience music and musicians, knowingly or not, manipulate it. Uh, one distinction I need to make to make sense of what Huron says is descriptivism versus prescriptivism. So in this world where we have things that are not so much either uh, tautologies or oxymorons, where you have things that are correct or incorrect, well, the descriptive way of putting that is you might say that jumping by a major seventh is rare. So in singing terms, that is almost jumping up an octave, but not quite. So it's really hard practically to hit if you were to sing. Um, but a uh, descriptivist might just say, well, it doesn't happen very often. There's, you know, you've, I've gone through a corpus, 100,000 notes, and there's only three times when that transition happens. That might be what they, a descriptivist says, it's rare. But a prescriptivist who might be following a tradition of musical composition might say it's wrong, it's a mistake. And there are plenty of rules like this and plenty of uh, traditions where you can pronounce things as incorrect. So if you're doing a musical composition class and you um, are having counterpoint and you have parallel fifths, uh, that means that you've got a, the two notes that you're harmonizing are a fifth apart in one, uh, like one bar and then it's the same interval later on. That's regarded as too boring and it's a mistake and the teacher will put like a red cross next to it in your mm. composition. Right, so you might, someone else might say, well, descriptivist, well, it turns out that when rock and roll people are playing power chords, they kind of they turn parallel fifths into a genre, maybe. And that's, just, <laughs> and that's rare in some circumstances and common in another circumstance, but a prescriptivist in a particular context would say that's incorrect. Um, so I might do a little bit of uh, demonstration, given this is music. Um, so one way that you could uh, approach making musical correctness more easily is to think about constraining the input types. Uh, so you're probably familiar with like The Sound of Music, uh, and you've got the famous song that you know talks about Do, Re, Mi, Fa, So. So what that lets you do is, theoretically in music, you can play any frequency, right? You could play 100 hertz, you could play 500 hertz, you could play 513 hertz. But what Solfege, the system does, is gives you names for particular ones. So it's almost like having an enumerated type or a sum type that lets you specify what notes are okay. So let's see if this is audible. Hopefully audible. Um, so this is, just for demo purposes, this is a closure script running in the browser and using the Web Audio API. So this is actually live, so I can um, mess about with it. So what this is a demonstration of, I guess, is the basic principle of what it looks like to code music. And the reason why it's easy for me to make something that sounds like a, a vague composition is because the affordance of having, and it's not typed in the sense of type checker, but in the sense of there being a specific constrained input, lets me pick what I'm gonna do really easily. And therefore lets me, without having to worry too much, make adjustments that make sense in the domain. So we will come back to that later. So this is a transcription of some data that uh, Huron puts in the book around 
the frequency of particular transitions between notes in solfege. So on the, the vertical axis is the first note, and then the horizontal axis is the note that is played subsequently. So one of the things you can see that's interesting is that there's kind of a vague stripe diagonal, which you could say evidences the principle of locality in music. So it's quite common for a note to lead to an adjacent note. And it's uncommon to have these big leaps, just like I said with the major seventh before. It's a big leap is, well, I'm not sure actually why, but it might be it's hard to sing or it's hard to uh, establish continuity. Uh, but you can also see there are some particularly hot spots where it turns out that playing the note between Do and Re, according to this, I think 62% of the time will resolve back down to Re. So this is a kind of a Markov model approximation of what is correct or incorrect in music. But the interesting thing is that you don't have, I mean, you do have some zeros, but those zeros are probably just because the data set isn't big enough. There isn't really a possibility here. There are just well-worn paths and really uncommon paths. And it's fairly, it's fairly kind of spread out. Uh, in the metric sense, so this is timing, so it's the same concept, but in timing, we're seeing a much darker red, much more specific things, which mm. makes sense. Right? We have locality and timing where you play one note, it's really likely that the next note is going to happen fairly soon after it. Sometimes there'll be a big gap, but usually playing one note tells you when the next one's going to be. And you can also, I don't know if you can see, where like underneath the six there, underneath the eight, there is every second. Uh, interval, there's a lot of uh, activity. So this is a, you know, this being German folk music, it's not particularly creative when it comes to the timing, right? Um, it's very predictable, which is fine because the idea is that overall, that level of uh, predictability, unpredictability, needs to be maintained throughout the whole of the music. So there are certain kinds of music that are really predictable metrically and have an interesting harmonic structure, that would be like European folk music, uh, hip hop, for example, would be the reverse. Mm. It's quite predictable harmonically, but has a much greater variety of metric structure. Uh, the reason why I think that's interesting is that if you're brought up in one particular tradition of music, you might look for the decoration and the interest in the same place that you found it in your own music. Mm. And so you might therefore look at another music and think it's boring. Or you might look at you know, electronica and say, well, these, the timing and the uh, harmonies are really boring. What's going on? And it turns out that the creativity in that genre is expressed through interesting manipulation of sound. So uh, one way that genres differ quite a lot is in what kind of channel they use to uh, convey their creativity. Uh, so we have these predictions. So this does give us a bit of an idea about what's correct and incorrect because uh, staying within the hot zone, the, the red bits, is correlates a lot with following the rules and doing something that is really uncommon is kind of breaking the rules. So some implications for this. Um, you can only listen to a song for the first time once. <laughs> um, that sounds kind of a tautology, and it is, but uh, the experience of listening to a piece of music for the first time is fundamentally different to a repeat listen. So you might have had some of your favorite songs you might have not really liked on the first listen, uh, and that's because every subsequent listen, you're listening to it relative to having the model of what is next coming up. You know, if you listen to Bohemian Rhapsody now, you're not surprised by the changes. You, you're, you're waiting for them, you're anticipating them. Um, another implication would be that Bach probably wouldn't have found Smells Like Teen Spirit catchy. Right? Uh, not because it's not a great song, but because the amount of uh, kind of model and expectation that would have needed to be built up for Bach to understand what the, the creativity in Smells Like Teen Spirit uh, wouldn't be there. So maybe if Bach had been born in this time, sure, maybe he would have loved grunge, but just transposing music from one era to another without uh, transposing that rich interpretive structure that comes from the statistical model of the music makes it fairly meaningless. It's like, you know, it's transmitting the symbols without, uh, without the code. Uh, and another implication is that appropriation of musical styles is quite a subtle and tricky topic. So if you have, uh, well, there's, a, there's kind of a worldwide industry at the moment um, where you have DJs from you know, wealthier countries like the US or Germany or Australia uh, scouring out interesting new sounds from other parts of the world. So <coughs> the Caribbean is one place where that's happened a lot. So you have people going in, uh, you know, white people going in and sitting in dance halls in Jamaica or whatever and trying to figure out what the hot new thing is there. And, that results in, you know, like jungle or something like that in dance music in Europe. 
And that doesn't mean that those DJs have necessarily plagiarized anything, because it doesn't mean that they've heard a song and they've, they've just reproduced it, because, well, to be honest, probably the statistical models and the interest and the intricacies of that music would not be appreciated raw by a European audience. Um, so they've kind of taken the feel of it, maybe put a, you know, a, a, a uns, uns, uns beat behind it to make it more predictable for European <laughs> audiences, right? Um, but have they taken something of value? Well, yes, they have, because the, uh, the human ingenuity that led to that music coming into being and the, all the conventions of it and where there's likely to be changes and what kind of uh, instrumentation is used, all that involved a lot of uh, human creativity over quite an advanced period of time, but our intellectual property conception only really recognizes the specific composition. Um, but now that we know that the composition itself is <coughs> the tip of the iceberg behind the interpretive structure behind it, well, what happens if someone uh, takes that? Um, so let's, let's do a little bit more demoing. Um, so just to, I want to actually prove to you that uh, the idea that uh, music can be meaningfully generated using Huron's uh, kind of Markov chain approach. So I'm going to start by doing a demonstration where we have uh, the strategy for generating pitch and duration is basically just pure randomness. So it doesn't respect any kind of pitch structure or metric structure. Um, and by the way, we can measure how much entropy it has based on the weights. I won't get into how you do that, but basically something that's more surprising is more entropy. Not particularly great, right? <laughs> um, because there's basically no structure there. Like, there's no ability for you to predict what is happening next because it is literally random. You can see that we've got like RAM here. This is, code is, this is not uh, code in slides, this is being executed. Um, so, one improvement we can make to that is a weighted model where we say, well, how, what is the most common notes we play in a piece and what is the most common gap between notes? What's the most common duration? And we can use that. Um, <coughs> The entropy in this ends up quite a bit lower. Um, by the way, as I um, mm -hmm. press space, it's just kind of changing it. So um, the, uh, the pitch entropy here is only like 30 bits, and the metric entropy is much lower. It was like 400 or something in the previous example. It's now about 60. So what I predict is if we play this, the, the metric uh, positioning will make some sense to our ears, uh, and as will the, uh, the actual melody itself. <laughs> right, I mean, it's boring, right? But it, it is more recognisably yeah, German music. So. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to put like stereotyping in this talk, but it just kind of comes out. When it comes <laughs> um, so let's try the contextual one. So that was just kind of raw weight, so it was context free, right? Where you were in the song wasn't uh, influencing what the next note should be. So this one we've actually, I'm just looking at this now, so this is 36 <coughs> bits of pitch entropy, which was very similar to the previous example, but it looks like the actual metric one on this particular random generation is quite predictable, so hopefully it'll be rhythmically meaningful, we'll see. Right, this is kind of more of a, more of a meaningful song, let's, let's just try a couple of the other examples to see. Uh, this should be uh, even lower, more, even more predictable metric uh, pattern. <laughs> right, it's still kind of weird, right? But it's a bit and this, this is a really simple model, right? This is just literally Markov chain using the data that Huron has in his book and just working out what is the next most likely thing. So you can, you know, if you want, I'll the demo, post the demo and you can play that if you want. Oh, there was one that was 11 bits, I should have played that. It sounds like really predictable. And you can just, I think what you can correlate is you'll see that when there's a higher metric, uh, higher entropy, it'll end up sounding weirder when there's a lower entropy. So this one should probably sound good from a rhythm point of view, but sound a bit weird on the pitch axis. Didn't sound too bad. Interesting question of authorship, right? So, <laughs> like, uh, based on the different combinations, 
that's probably never happened before, that exact one, right? So like, did I write it by writing the weightings? Did the people who compiled the data write it? I don't know. Let's get avoid getting too deep into that rabbit hole. Can, can, can you so, store that? Hmm? Can, can you store that? Um, no. The sequence, can you put that up? No, it's gone. No. Right. It's locked. <laughs> yeah, it's lost. <laughs> Uh, could someone who had more time and skill as a programmer make that possible? Totally. Have I done that? No. Okay. Uh, so, to start to think what's going on here, um, if you look at the top, I've just got a representation of the solfege, right? Do, re, mi. And we're actually building a tower of interpreters to get down to the metal, right? To get down to the actual pitch frequency. So, do, re, mi can actually be translated in a particular key to this is C major, so C, D, E. Um, you can then translate it to a MIDI code. So those numbers, 72, 73, 74, are a way of numbering the keys on a piano. Um, and you can see that 73 is not accessible in this game, which is important. Uh, and then you can map the MIDI down to specific frequencies, given you have a, a particular kind of temperament, which, don't worry, you don't need to know what that is. But basically, there's a series of mappings now. And the key feature, and maybe also bug of this scheme, is there are inaccessible places. So it's really good because I can't, if I'm playing just solfege, I can't accidentally play 73. There's no way of getting there because it's unrepresentable. If you're talking about making invalid states unrepresentable, it's not there. Um, on the other hand, maybe that's desirable. Maybe we do want to skip floors on the Tower of Interpreters because the idea of an accidental or a note that's out of key is a core musical concept. That's not something that's strange. That's maybe not something you learn in your first few months when you're learning to play the piano. But there is such a thing as an accidental, meaning a note that is not accessible within our key. So if we do ask people to compose in solfege, it's actually quite simplistic because if they want to play 70 or they want to play whatever that frequency is there, you know, 298 hertz, uh, we haven't made it possible. And I think that's a, that's a trade-off because the more power you give someone, the more access you give them to every possible inhabitant of the, the space, uh, the more they can do with it, but it also doesn't give them any uh, assistance or guidance. This is where we get back to that earlier idea of uh, being a couple of different kinds of things that types might want to rule out. They might want to rule out things that are impossible, contradictions. There's no elephant, there's no apple, there's no chair anywhere there. You can't accidentally play something that's not a note. Um, on the other hand, we're starting with these kind of uh, more advanced uh, towers of interpreters to rule out things that are meaningful in the domain. Flat note is meaningful to a musician. You can talk about it to a musician. You might not want it in a particular context, but it's something that could theoretically be part of the domain. So there's a couple of different <coughs> strategies that different musical instruments um, apply to this. So just check my time. Um, so a piano is, in some sense, a digital instrument to the kind of pedantic definition of di digital. There's a bunch of buttons, and you, each time you press a button, there's a little hammer in the back, and it goes wham on a string. You can't adjust the string unless you're getting someone to tune your piano. So whichever button you press, you get that exact note. So that means that it's impossible to play a flat note or to bend a note to get some vibrato and expression. So that's both good and bad. So a violin player might say, well, this is rubbish. How do you, how do you play vibrato? How do you make the music meaningful? Or a piano player might say, well, this is great because the way this instrument is built, invalid states are unrepresentable. I can't <laughs> play the note between that button and that button. That's awesome. Uh, so it's a trade-off. As I said, the violin player might make the opposite trade-off. So you see that neck of the violin. There's, uh, you put your finger on the string, and that controls how long the string is, and that controls the pitch of the note. So in a violin, you've got all the possibilities. You can play slides. You can play whales. You can mess up all the time. Right? <laughs> If you probably prefer to listen to a child learn to play the piano than learn to play the violin. Right? <laughs> because the violin gives you much less guidance in terms of, you might think of it, than I do, in terms of types. It gives you much less guidance about what you're allowed to play and what you aren't allowed to play. Um, but <clears throat> because you have that power, you can also use it for cool effects, and you can also use it for other traditions of music. So you could, you could uh, adjust tunings or expectations to, you know, Carnatic music and you'd be fine. You try to do that with piano, you can't because the piano is tuned and has baked in assumptions about what kind of music you want to play. A guitar is a cool example of a hybrid design. So a guitar, it looks a bit like a violin obviously, right? But you can see those bands along the neck of the guitar. So what those are is those are guides. 
So if you put your finger so that the string is shortened on one of those bands, uh, you're getting a particular discrete pitch. But what you can do is you can bend it, right? So if you kind of pull the string, you're making the string tighter, which makes the note higher. So a guitar gives you that kind of default way to play in type, but also gives you an escape hatch, is another way of thinking about it. Um, so I want to get more into this whole idea of musical correctness. So one particularly awesome project is Mezzo in the Haskell world. Um, it's a composition library by uh, Dima Samos. Um, and it takes uh, the concepts from the Haskell School of Expression, which is a really cool way of uh, learning Haskell, uh, and, and puts dependent types on it. So it enforces rules of musical composition at compile time. So you try to do those parallel fifths, or that jump by the major seventh, or your code won't compile. Which I think is really awesome. And he describes it as a very strict spell check of music, which I think is a great metaphor. Um, so to be clear, I really, really like it, but I'm going to, I guess, critique some of the, the ideology that, that leads to it. Um, so this compiles, C, D, E, F. It's just notes in a row. We're respecting musical locality. That's all fine. The second example. C, uh, C, B, E, F, which has that jump, that major seventh jump, uh, it doesn't compile, it's not allowed. So, uh, good, I guess that's good if you don't want to have it, but then for some reason you do want to have it, uh, well, what's your, what's, your, um, what, what, what's your comeback? Where do you go from there? So, um, what's the error message? What's the error message? <laughs> not as bad as you might think. Um, it, uh, it is actually kind of meaningful, but uh, still a bit clunky. Not, not something that you would expose to someone who wasn't a programmer, and probably not something you should expose to a programmer you liked either. <laughs> uh, so uh, here's a really good example of uh, Demon discussing the implications of his work. So he's talking about Chopin's prelude. Uh, this piece could be transcribed in almost in its entirety However, occasionally I had to leave out a few notes <laughs> as they would create forbidden intervals, which Mezzo pointed out. So I think you can really easily see the tension in just in that one statement between well, who are the rules for, right? If Chopin's not in charge of the rules, like who is, who is, who is it who has such authority over music that they can tell Chopin what he is and isn't allowed to do? Unsafe perform Chopin. Uh, uh, exactly, unsafe, uh, the, unsafe perform Chopin. That's exactly the kind of thing. <laughs> That is a strategy. So, you, so Mezzo is not a crude piece of software. You can decide to opt into rules or opt out of rules. That's fine. Um, but the trouble is that when you switch off the rule, it's gone. Whereas if we looked at our earlier theory of statistical uh, expectation in music, we don't really want to... There are things that are unusual. We might want to permit them. But the fact that they're unusual is actually part of the value of them because they add interest. You don't want to just have this binary, either it's OK or not OK. Um, so uh, I had this challenge to try to work out, well, if I'm critiquing this awesome library, what, 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 would, you, what would I do better if I, if I was trying to uh, live up to my own standards? Um, so uh, the final thing that I will leave you with from Dima is that um, the fact that he had to like, drop the rules shows that the library works, which is a very optimistic spin, I like that, um, as well as the fact that it's perfectly common for composers to break the rules for artistic effect. So the breaking of the rules itself is a meaningful concept in the domain. Um, so uh, if you're not into Idris or dependent types, don't worry too much. Right? This is more an illustration, a proof of possibility. Um, but uh, this is Idris, very similar to Haskell, has dependent types um, that are kind of first class baked into it. Uh, you have uh, Solfege as a, as a data type. So we have Do, Re, Mi, et cetera. So that's good. Um, the way this code works, and I'll show you a better example in a second, is that it, uh, the type expresses that a melody starts on a particular note and ends on a particular note, and has a complexity or a cost within the range, within a particular range. So this has more than five bits of entropy and less than 20 bits of entropy. And the way that it works, which you won't need to follow on too closely, I'll, I'll skip ahead in a second, is that each time you compose together melodies, uh, it tracks the complexity of what you're doing in the type. So let's you do something like this. So the first example is a conventional melody that starts from Do and goes to So. So that's, that first line is the type signature. And if that melody did not have between 8 and 16 bits of entropy, then that wouldn't compile. So that lets you as a composer set expectations of the range of possibility. So if it was more boring than that, more boring than 8 bits, then it also wouldn't compile, which is something that the, like the Mezzo uh, approach doesn't really let you do. It forbids it if it's weird, but if it's, if it's good, it's good. Um, so to take the other example, this is the same example on the Mezzo homepage where we go from Do to T, so that's the, 
made your seventh jump, um, I would have had to adjust the, uh, the range of uh, entropy that I'm expecting. Um, or else it wouldn't compile. So if you use that type signature from that second example, saying it's a melody from Do to So with that, uh, sorry, so if you, uh, if you took the, the 8 to 16 and applied it down there, it would no longer compile. Um, so but it's, yeah, this is a really kind of awkward and elaborate way to get to what I'm trying to say, which is that uh, you really have to think in terms of uh, how much cost doing a particular thing has. So in conclusion, be careful that <coughs> innovative states might be unrepresentable. Um, dependent types can help in doing this, um, and if you really want to learn about it, uh, have check out Sweet Anticipation. Um, but one more coda that I want to do, because I think we have a tendency to try to impose these type structures on society, and given we're automating more of society, that's quite important. Or we, you know, we could easily end up with more disasters, like having columns in your database that's Boolean, that is, is male, right? Where you've tried to impose a algebraic structure on a reality that won't admit it. Um, but a harmonica is a really good example uh, of this kind of resistance to categorization. So a harmonica is a bit, uh, it's, the way that it works is if you blow on it, you're playing notes from the key that the harmonica is in. So this is a G harmonica, so it's really easy to play something that sounds kind of cool just by blowing randomly. And then when you suck on it, it uh, the draw, as it's called, that will play notes from a, the secondary chord in that key. So you can start to play back and forth. And it makes it really easy because it makes it really approachable to play the right thing, like the toy violin or the piano. But the thing about this is that the physics of this means that it's possible if you suck on it in the right way, not in the way that I suck on the harmonica, but if you if you didn't take care of it the right way, you'll, you'll, you can bend a note outside what the instrument is supposed to do. So I don't know if I can manage it, but... To create that kind of like bluesy sound, right? So that's, that's outside, that's, that's breaking the type system. That's unsafe to perform like blue note, right? <laughs> and even more interestingly, so when you exhale, it's really hard to do that bending. So when you exhale, you're playing the primary chord of the key, and when you inhale, you're playing the secondary one. So what blues player tend to do is something called cross hopping, which is misusing the instrument to an even greater extent, which is that uh, you play it in the wrong key. So where it's supposed to be in G, you actually make the primary chord that you want to do on the inhaling one, which is important because that lets you do all the interesting bending on the primary chord. Of the, of the key, so it lets you do much more interesting effect. So I just wanted to close with that as an example of where you might, as a programmer, think that you have a, an interesting categorization. You might try to make things impossible, but you may very well face uh, resistance, and it may very well be to very good and important effect. Thanks very much. Questions. So, are you using any MIDI controllers to make music like MPE and Ableton? Or? So, the, the question was, are you using any MIDI controllers? Uh, I personally am not, but uh, there's a very rich scene of uh, Algo Rave, tends to be the genre name. Um, there's a very rich scene of people who do. And, um, uh, Sam Aaron's work on Sonic Pi is a good example of using all sorts of cool MIDI controllers. I tend to end up going down the rabbit hole of designing type systems for the music and never actually finishing the music, but that's just me. Uh, so even just now you mentioned that you've tried a few different type systems, you demonstrated yeah. a few different options, and yeah. you showed the interest one, and et cetera. Which is your preferred level of uh, constraint and expressivity? I guess my preferred level is, uh, like I don't think actually compile time works for me because you need to give the compiled system or your particular type system too much information about what you plan to do and I find it hard to do in advance. Um, I generally find that I have a better time when I'm working with that kind of like that list level thing mm -hmm. but it is very important that, that kind of uh, imaginary type system you get when you're programming in uh, whole numbers you know you're in key and you only type in fractional numbers and you end up out of key so I think I'm a bit more like the guitar player where I want to see where the boundaries are, mm. but be able to, with just a little bit more effort than nothing, push beyond them. 
uh, if I understood it correctly, so basically yeah. you're trying to avoid unconscious mistakes in the music, right? Mm. So basically, suppose I'm a musician, and if I want intentionally to do this, uh, you know, uh, to do this to have the creativity in it, then I can do it. But unconsciously, I can like I will not be allowed to do it, right? I, I think that's a really nice way of distinguishing conscious, conscious and unconscious. There are still slight problems with that because what is a mistake mm -hmm. is sometimes only defined in retrospect. So I'll give an example of where like Herbie Hancock and Miles Davis mm -hmm. playing a concert. Um, Herbie Hancock kind of tells us as an example of Miles Davis' genius. So uh, he's got it going through, everything's right, he's like a young musician, he's playing with his hero, it's awesome. And then he just fucks up, right? Mm -hmm. He plays the wrong chord at the wrong moment. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely at that point a mistake. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But Miles Davis' reaction to it which was to hear that and go off in a direction suggested by that music and then incorporate that into the piece, mm -hmm. meant it was no longer a mistake. So to the audience, it sounded like a big a spike in entropy of here's an unusual bit, mm -hmm. but it was made retrospectively intentional. Mm -hmm. So unconscious and conscious, really good distinction, but I think <laughs> even that slightly breaks down in the context of performance. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I get it. It's, it was really a cool talk. Cool. I just Thanks. loved it, yeah. Um, does any of your analysis or any of these libraries think in larger, larger structures of the music? So, for example, if you were to generate 100 notes and you're trying to do it after Bach, could you yeah. reliably get it to modulate from C to G and back, or is it just going to be sort of note to note all the time? So, I think when it comes to larger musical musical structures, the work that succeeded is based on kind of neural nets and probabilistic. Kind of things, and it still struggles. The large, like you used the example of modulating keys, I think. Um, those kind of statistical weightings are really good at the micro, which might be your suggestion, but really poor at the macro. I don't think you can kind of represent key changes explicitly if you're writing code. You say, let's transform these notes into this key and this one, so you could transcribe it. I don't think the generation works so, so well, and I think it's for similar reasons why you can make something that looks like Shakespeare uh, in terms of the words, but doesn't have a Shakespearean plot, that it's actually harder to approach that. So. Will we get that? I don't know. I think that probably for pop songs and so on, um, neural nets will become a more viable way of at least generating candidates for hits than human intervention. The reason is that uh, not because humans aren't great composers, but because what makes a good pop song is going slightly beyond what the current convention is. So to write the next hit, you have to have a really excellent analysis of the weightings of probability and likelihood of where the pieces on the radio are right now, and then go one step further. So I think that will, in the end, become an exhausting task for even the Swedes, who clearly are the dominant force in creating like these kind of mechanized pockets at the moment, um, that you'll end up having to get to that point. I don't know whether you'll end up with you know, opera or large-scale works, I guess probably eventually, but that will take a lot longer. Um, oh, so. Um, so we're question temporal or, temporal or liveness types. Uh, that would be really nice because uh, there are some basic kind of hyper properties that you want to enforce when you're in performance, like not everything stops at once if you make a mistake, which is you know a, a fundamental problem of this where you know uh, I've had it happen or there's other, if you have a single thread and you're playing the music and then you get some kind of uncatchable exception, the music stops. Uh, I haven't done any of that, but I can see that actually actually would be a good practical application because it would uh, it would give you that guarantee that you're not going to have the awkward kind of silence on the dance floor moment, which is very easy to do. Um, so I think it was one. One last question. Yeah. Um, have you thought of any other parameters for entropy music other than timing and pitch change? Um, have I considered other parameters beyond uh, timing and pitch? I think the short answer is. No, it's not that they are obviously, as you suggest, really interesting area to explore. I think they're just much less tractable. Um, it's really easy to, to get the data for timing and pitch, uh, and it's really easy programmatically to mess around with it. So I don't, I don't think, um, I don't think that kind of explicit uh, neural net stuff. I'm sure it, it takes into account all sorts of weighted variables that maybe even the creators don't understand. Um, but in terms of that explicit alt notation, uh, I don't think uh, very much yet. That's a good suggestion. Great. Let's thank Chris once again.